board. Yeah, I can see the recording button. Hello, everyone. We are excited to welcome you this, to this virtual meeting about the IFR for NPO project and how it is relevant for stakeholders in Ghana. This meeting is hosted by International Needs Ghana, and we are glad to be collaborating with IFR for NPO as country champions in association with the Institute of Chartered Accountants Ghana to ensure stakeholders are aware of the project and most importantly, to encourage you to participate. We are also joined by Samantha Musoki, who is the IFR for NPO Project Director for Humentum. This is the meeting overview, and um, it is a meeting rather than a training webinar. Although we are online rather than in person, we've built in time for small group discussions and use of the chat function to encourage interaction, discussion, and feedback. Altogether, we expect to have two hours. Um, as you can see, there are two blocks of short presentations with a small group discussion and feedback in between. You might be wondering why we do have a, a picture of NPO activity in the background. As we discuss issues of financial reporting for NPOs, we will like to keep in mind that NPO financial reports have little meaning apart from the context of the great work that NPOs do around the world. And here in Ghana, in health and social services, in education and in research, environmental protection, development, aid, advocacy, religion, culture, recreation, and the list is endless. It's important that we observe um, some protocols for this meeting in order to ensure we have a successful meeting. For all participants, I would entreat you to um, keep the speaker view as you would find that more helpful than the gallery view. When we go into our breakout sessions, it would then be more helpful to use the gallery view uh, instead of the speaker view. It's important that you keep your microphones off and at the same time, you keep your video off if you like during the presentation. However, during the small group discussion, it will be important to turn your video on so that we can have meaningful and um, interactive discussions. Please do feel free to type a comment or a question in the chat at any time. Uh, these can be directed to the host, uh, myself or Samantha, or to everyone as appropriate. And when we report back from the small group session, it might be helpful to use the raise hand function if you are a nominated spokesperson ready to share some feedback from your group. To raise your hand, you click on participants in the control panel, and from there you see a button to raise or lower your hand. It's time for introductions. And um, before we do that, I like on behalf of the IFR for NPO project secretariat, and then on behalf of international needs as country champions to recognize and welcome Professor Williams Atulik, the president of the Institute of Chartered Accountants, Ghana. Uh, Mrs. Sena Dake Anape, who is the vice president of the Institute of Chartered Accountants, Ghana. We also do want to recognize Mr. Paul Kwesi Achiman, the chief executive officer of the Institute of Chartered Accountants, Ghana. We would like to recognize all participants on this call. And therefore, you could please introduce yourselves by using the chat function. Please type in there your name, your role, and the organization. Um, at the end of the session, Samantha 
or I would um, duly recognize and acknowledge all participants. So you will not be able to introduce yourself using the microphone. Please use the chat feature to just introduce yourself, name, role, and organization. So first of all, we will take about 20 minutes to introduce you to the IFR for NPO project. All apologies to those of you who may already be familiar with it, but hopefully it will be a quick intro and a reminder so that we make sure we are all on the same page. That will be helpful as we get into the latter parts of, of the meeting. I believe that most of us are quite familiar with the term NGO, particularly in the Ghanaian context. NGO stands for non-governmental organization. But this project is talking about NPOs. Now, NPO mean not profit organization. So let's make sure we are clear uh, about that from the start. NGOs are a subset of a larger group of NPOs. And examples of NPOs that are not NGOs, examples of NPOs that are not NGOs might include universities, hospitals, political parties, societies, or churches. All these are organizations that are classified as NPOs. The hope is that this project will be applicable to the full range of nonprofit organizations, including NGOs. IFR for NPO is a five-year initiative to develop the first ever internationally applicable financial reporting guidance for non-profit organizations. It's coordinated by Humentum and the Chartered Institute of Public Finance and Accountancy. You probably know that businesses have international financial reporting standards and governments have international public sector accounting standards. But the not-for-profit sector has no equivalent. This undermines the consistency and usefulness of financial reports and ultimately harms the sense of trust and accountability that is so central to its effectiveness. The current system is also inefficient, with duplication of effort for both NPO and funders in meeting multiple and at times conflicting financial requirements. An academic study in 2014 received responses from 179 countries. 72% of respondents agreed that an international standard for NPOs would be useful. So, the IFR for NPO project is answering this call. By engaging a wide range of stakeholders, the new guidance will command support from the accounting community and NPOs, as well as those that fund and regulate them. The guidance is being developed in a technically rigorous three-step process, involving a consultation phase and development of an exposure draft, with final guidance available from early 2025, with the goal that at least 10 countries will use the guidance by 2030, with more to follow. The project has a technical advisory group, involving national standard setters from every continent, and an official observer from the International Accounting Standards Board. And the Practitioner Advisory Group helps us ensure the guidance will meet users' needs. The founding funders share our vision for this game-changing project. We have the opportunity of a generation. We can increase accountability and transparency while reducing inefficiency in the current system. So we just watched a short video on the IFR for NPO project. This video is available on the project website as well as the YouTube channel. If you visit YouTube or the project website, you can download um, a copy of this video or watch it in the comfort of your home at a 
another time that is uh, more convenient to you. So we will proceed by um, looking at the accounting system of NPOs. And we hope that this video you have just watched has given you an important and exciting sense of what this project is all about. One question that is often raised is, um, which type of NPO financial reports is this project developing guidance for? It is important to notice that NPOs produce different kinds of financial reports. So it is important to be clear uh, which reports are and are not the focus of the IFR for NPO project. All transactions of an NPO should be entered in their accounting system, which classifies and summarizes those transactions to produce various reports. Some reports are for internal purposes and are used by managers and directors of the organization. And when MPOs implement donor funded projects, they are often required to produce special purpose reports specifically for that donor about that project. And every year, the organization produces its annual financial statement, uh, which must be audited. And are also known as general purpose financial statement. All of these reports are from the same accounting system, at least ideally that should uh, be what should happen. It is important to state that the IFR for NPO project is focusing on the general purpose financial statement. That is the audited financial statement with its accompanying notes and narrative reports. Of course, the different types of um, reports are connected because they are created from the same source transactions. And um, some of them, or probably all of them from the same accounting system. It's also important to notice that Humentum is working on another project that is seeking to harmonize uh, reporting formats, reporting formats for donor funded projects. So just to wrap up, it's important to realize that the IFR for NPO project is focusing on general purpose financial statements. It's important to also think about the stakeholders. Who are the stakeholders being considered in this project? The IFR for NPO project is responding to challenges expressed by three broad categories of stakeholders. The first stakeholders are the users. And in this category, we have donors, we have regulators, we have clients, we have um, the general public. Other service users, we may also call beneficiaries or clients, the general public, banks, collaborating partners, suppliers, and even staff. Within this large group of um, users, are uh, the donors who are particularly influential. And if the requirements for the IFR for NPU guidance conflict with some of the donor reporting requirements, it is certain to cause problems for NPUs. But the donors themselves use of the general purpose financial reports for due diligence and understanding the organization as a whole. So, the donors use the general purpose financial statement to understand and assess the capacity and capability of um, NPOs. And therefore it's important that they understand the context of these financial statements and therefore quite um, an influential group for us. The second category of um, stakeholders are the preparers, the non-profit organizations themselves. It is important to also realize that as a critical stakeholder, uh, they need to really balance the cost of preparing these financial statements with the benefits uh, to users, um, need to really be managed and managed carefully. 
It is for this reason that um, the preparers have been selected and highlighted as a critical stakeholder in this uh, project. For example, some information may be of interest to users, but very, very difficult for preparers to really measure. And the third group are the independent assurance providers, auditors, you may like to call them. And um, whether the financial statements present a true and fair view, that is the role of the auditors. And they are often the front line for supporting NPUs to implement and apply applicable accounting standards or guidance. It is important to add that the IFR for NPO project does not represent any particular group, but it is keen to develop guidance that balances the costs and the benefits to the different stakeholders. Now, what exactly is this project aiming to deliver? What is the change that the project is seeking to bring about? There are many challenges that are expressed by stakeholders. And they stem from the core problem that there are, there's no internationally applicable standard for how MPUs prepare their annual financial statements. Where countries do not have national standards, this leads to inconsistency even within the same jurisdiction. For larger NPUs, inconsistency between countries make consolidation difficult and expensive. When funders look at the financial statements of potential grantees, they may find it hard to assess financial capability or understand the wider context for a particular project. And this results in expensive and often duplicative processes for due diligence, financial reporting, and auditing. The lack of clarity and consistency ultimately reduces the transparency in the sector, which makes funders nervous, especially about double funding fraud, which is harder to spot given the focus on project-based reports. And therefore, the solution is that the IFR for NPO guidance is seeking country and funder adoption decisions that aims at producing future outcomes and benefits that are wide ranging. For NPOs applying the guidance, it means they will be better able to demonstrate their capacity and attract funds, as well as supporting the provision of decision, useful information, the provision of useful information for governance and management. For funders, it contributes to better and more efficient due diligence, which is a win for NPOs too. And having clear guidance simplifies and improves the value of audit assurance. One of the other really important outcomes for this project, separate from the guidance itself, is the creation of a global community of stakeholders able to engage and collaborate to solve sector-wide issues. And this has never existed before. It's important to find out who are behind this project. The project is being implemented by two organizations in partnership, Humentum and SIPFA. Humentum is a global organization or global association that convenes nonprofit organizations and professionals and inspires sector-wide change. The Chartered Institute of Public Finance and Accountancy is a UK-based standard-setting um, professional accountancy body for local governments and charities. But it also plays an important role in as an international convener on public sector accounting issues. Both Humentum and SEPFA are themselves non-profit organizations. 
And between them, the project partners are well connected to a wide range of stakeholders within the sector that are critical to this project. You have nonprofit organizations, you have funders, standard setters, the accounting and audit community. All together, this is really a project by the sector for the sector. It's important to add that seed funding for this project has been provided by the Ford Foundation and the Open Society um, Foundation. The project is not fully funded and fundraising is currently ongoing for this project. There are also two advisory groups uh, who offer their perspectives and expertise on a voluntary basis. You have the technical advisory group that comprises national accounting standard setters from five continents and the practitioner advisory group, including preparers, users, auditors, and academics specializing in nonprofits. We are deliberately and proactively seeking to build and maintain diversity in these groups. Information about each member and details of the meetings are all available on the project website. So the process is fully transparent. It's important to now think about timelines. Uh, we have looked at why this project is important, clarified what the project will achieve and who the project partners, stakeholders and advisors are. Now we'll get an overview of how and when by looking at the phases and the timelines. So the project is a three phase process equivalent to other standard setting processes. Phase one, as a consultation phase. And the key output is a consultation paper, which presents questions for structured input from stakeholders. Um, we will talk more about this particular uh, phase in the next stage or next session of this presentation. The second phase is the development phase where we expect to analyze the feedback from the consultation phase and use that as evidence to develop draft guidance, which will be exposed for comments. It is called an exposure draft. The third phase takes stock of feedback from the exposure draft and puts through changes before launching the final guidance which is expected in early 2025. Thereafter, there will be training and transition following the adoption of the guidance. This is why there are two key aspects of the IFR for NPO project. One aspect is the technical rigor that is applied in the guidance development process. And this is led by SIFA. The other aspect is the stakeholder engagement led by Humentum, actively reaching to stakeholders all over the world, regulators, national professional accountancy organizations, donors, and MPUs to participate in the development process so that they are ready and willing to adapt what is produced and when it is all done. The project has already had some engagement from people all over the world. There are countries in blue, and these are where individuals have signed up and registered for their interest in this project. And they include a broad, a broad range of stakeholders, including both international and local NPOs, their auditors, the accountancy bodies, regulators, donors, and others. The yellow flags show members of the technical advisory group of national standard setters. The dark red shows members of the practitioner advisory group. And the black flags show the various country champions working to engage 
stakeholders in their countries to ensure that those voices are heard. At this stage, I'd like to introduce the project director for the IFR for NPO project, Samantha Musoki. Samantha is a UK trained chartered accountant, having qualified with Mazars in 2000, specializing in charity audits. She moved to Uganda in 2001 and has held various roles in nonprofit sector. In the nonprofit sector, as auditor, CFO, grant management advisor, board member, and treasurer, as well as carrying out training and consultancy assignments across Africa. She has been an associate with Humentum since 2004 and became regional director East Africa in 2017 before taking on the role as director for the IFR for NPO project in 2019. Ladies and gentlemen, my pleasure, my pleasure to introduce to you Samantha Musoke, who will take over the next session of the presentation. Thank you so much, Edmund, for that uh, introduction. Um, I'm really delighted and honored to be with you here today. I'm just admitting people as there's still some people joining. So as Edmund said, my name is Samantha Musoke. I'm uh, from UK, but I've lived in Uganda for um, 20 years. So I'm very uh, familiar with the African context, although I haven't been to Ghana, which I regret deeply, and I look forward to coming to visit Edmund before too long. So um, Edmund's given us a really wonderful introduction and overview to this um, project. But now we wanted to give you a chance to break into two groups and just really talk among yourselves and uh, meet each other and discuss some of your reactions and responses to it. So uh, we'll have 20 minutes. What, when you get into your group, basically I'll, I'll set up the groups and you'll find yourself in a new smaller Zoom room. Do turn on your microphone, do turn on your video because you'll have better conversation. Um, the, so the first thing to do is just briefly greet each other, get to know each other. The second thing is to share any questions or comments or reactions to what you've heard from Edmund. What things come to your mind? Um, do you feel positive about it? Are you thinking, well, what about this? Are you having questions, um, comments and reactions? And then the third thing is uh, either to look at uh, benefits or challenges. You might not have time to do both. So if you want to think about benefits, uh, thinking you know, what, what might this mean for stakeholders in Ghana? If this project completes, when we get this guidance and uh, stakeholders in Ghana and around the world have a common uh, basis for preparing their annual audited financial statements, what could the benefits be uh, to your stakeholders? So to have a think through some of the knock-on impacts you can imagine. And then also you could might think about what challenges might there be uh, for you as stakeholders in Ghana? What challenges can you foresee and any solutions in case you have them, that would be brilliant. So that will be, give us really interesting and important feedback, especially for Edmund as country champion in thinking about um, how to frame and how to engage and how to overcome any, any roadblocks. So when we come back together, um, it'd be great before you, before you break, um, it'd be good to just nominate a spokesperson who can then uh, report back on behalf of the group. But we, we're only two groups, so it's not, so, it's not, not going to be so difficult. So it's now um, half past. If, uh, if I'll give you 20 minutes and we'll bring the rooms back at uh, 10.2. If you have any problems, you can ask the presenter to come and join you in the room. So you can summon me and I'll come and help you. And I'll also post you the questions and your instructions in there. So uh, enjoy, see you in 20 minutes. Welcome back, everybody. Um, I can see many people have returned from your small group chats. I hope you had a nice time talking to each other. 
Um, so what we're going to do now is get some feedback from the nominated spokespeople. Um, and we'll start with the questions and comments and reactions first. Uh, then we'll move to the benefits and, and the challenges. So uh, would either of the groups like to share some of your questions or reactions or comments in response to Edmund's initial presentation? You can use the raise hand feature or just unmute yourself and speak up. Who'd like to go first? Edmund, is somebody feeding back from your group? Oh yes, Ikea will be feeding back from our group. Ikea, you can take it away. You're welcome, Ikea. Do you need me to unmute you? Ah, oh, hang on a second. Let me see. Maybe you're muted. Um, you should be able to unmute yourself. Thank you. Actually, I was trying to unmute myself and it was not happening. Sorry. Um, <laughs> good morning once again to everyone. Uh, for our group, we looked at the benefits and uh, uh, challenges and any how to overcome them. We had a very interesting discussion and uh, the time ran away from us, you know, before we could <laughs> But some of our thoughts were, especially with the benefits, was uh, uh, uniformity. Um, we, we, we think uh, the proposed or the proposal of the standardized uh, uh, general financial system was, uh, it will bring more uniformity, uh, uh, different accounting systems, you know, uh, we'll be able to generate one financial statement. It will allow for comparison uh, between uh, uh, different statements to be done. Uh, there will be harmonization of uh, reporting requirements. Uh, uh, um, and reports can be done to meet uh, various donor requirements, you know, and um, one key thing that came up to was it will allow the accountants and the finance people to work very smart because now that there's that uniformity and not uh, meeting all the various donors and their different uh, requirements, uh, it will really be helpful, uh, reduce some level of effort and uh, make uh, these teams very efficient and effective and be able to work very smart. These are some of the benefits that uh, uh, we thought uh, this proposal will bring. And uh, for uh, some of the, uh, not challenges, are how to overcome them. Uh, uh, we, we, we were thinking about training. Uh, if uh, we are able to deploy uh, the system, uh, uh, there should be a lot of training or training to be done extensively for everybody to come on board for easy transition into the new system. And uh, for the MPOs that are uh, uh, more international, uh, we thought of representation in this phase of discussion across board uh, from all countries or selected countries. And Ed wanted to talk about this uh, to be able to get uh, the mother bodies buy in. I'll use my organization as an example, FHI is global and uh, we have our headquarters in US. So uh, the discussion should include the teams in headquarters to get their buy in uh, because with the buy in, it will ensure that uh, all the countries uh, uh, within these MPOs are able to be they, they will be brought into the, the, the loop and uh, included uh, in this whole process. Uh, I think in summary, this was what uh, uh, we discussed. And I leave my team members to add on if I, let, uh, I left anything out. Uh, thank you very much. Super, thank you so much, Akua. Um, let me just um, respond to a few of those uh, 
comments that you've made, some fantastic observations. Um, you mentioned about uniformity, comparability, harmonization. Absolutely, these are real, really things that we're hoping to achieve. But there's one thing you said I wanted to pick up on, which was that instead of donor requirements, we can follow the IFR for MPO. And I wish that were true, wouldn't that be nice? But the fact is, I think the donor reports and you know the monthly project reports, quarterly project reports, that isn't gonna suddenly go away or stop just because we have a harmonized uh, basis for doing our annual year-end accounts. However, we are working on uh, some other projects, Money Where It Counts, the True Cost Project and the Grand Bargain to work with donors to harmonize the project reporting that different donors need. And at the same time, this IFR for MPO project is working to harmonize the year-end audited accounts. So if you've got one way of doing your donor reports and one way of doing your year-end audited accounts, that should be a much simpler world to live in than the one we have now, which is a million donor reports and a million <laughs> year-end accounts uh, formats. So I just wanted to clarify that, that um, I think it's one of the slides that Edmund showed at the beginning. This project is focusing on your year-end annual audited accounts, and it won't, it isn't directly um, impacting on donor reports. So I think that's quite a impo really important uh, clarification to get. They do, they are linked, and I think many, some of the variety in donor requirements and reporting formats exist precisely because there is no international standard for how MPOs should do their reporting. So donors have kind of filled that gap with a variety of uh, different um, practices. So that's really important. And then uh, you talked about uh, your headquarters, for example, in the US. So um, absolutely, we are, uh, I'll show you, uh, I can share the website for the project and we've got events just like this one in Ghana. We have one for the US coming up. We have one for the UK coming up. And we're very much engaging with NPOs uh, in headquarters, but also with the actual regulators in those countries. So FASB, the Financial Accounting Standards Board in the US, they are the body that will tell FHI in the US how they need to do their global accounting, which accounting standards. In the UK, it's the Financial Reporting Standard that have issued the UK SORP. So any organization with a UK headquarters, they have to follow the UK guidelines. So in this project, we're engaging not only with the MPOs, but also with their regulators. FASB in the US and FRC in the UK are part of the technical advisory group. Um, so it's important that your headquarters know about it, but it's also the regulators in those countries. Um, we need a really uh, global joined up stakeholder engagement to get adoption. Because as you say, it's not just, if you're FHI in Ghana, you might not have a lot of choice. You've got to do what your Ghana regulator tells you and you've got to do what your head office tells you and you've got to do what your donors tell you. So um, that's why we're working very strongly with all those, those different stakeholders. So that's fantastic uh, observations there. Thank you so much, Akua. Um, and from the other group, are there any other benefits or challenges or questions and comments? You can, you should be- My name is Charles. Yes, come in Charles, and thank you. We spent all the time looking at the benefits and before we became aware, there was no time to look at the challenges. But I've noted the challenges as presented by a and we agree with that. When it comes to the benefits, apart from what has been reported, we also noted that the standards are going to enhance transparency when it comes to the operations of various non-for-profit organizations. Because there are common standards, donors who know what to expect, auditors who know how to go about their business. When it comes to assessment of various MPOs due to due, on due diligence. It's very simple to undertake that. So 
transparency will be one of the key issues. Then we also noted that the standards are going to help in financial sustainability of the NGOs because of the simplification of the reporting system. Now with the different approaches of reporting, it's very difficult to confirm the profit line of most of the not-for-profit organizations. Some would erroneously take the, all the grant they receive as income and the expenditures for that particular year as expenditures. And the bottom line might involve funds which are meant for projects in subsequent years, which have not been utilized. So the standard will make things very, very simple. And when it comes to assessing the profitability of a non-for-profit organization, at least you'll be able to know. Because even though we call them non-for-profit organizations, there's always a bottom line which needs to be considered, else they will not be sustainable. Then we also noted, even though you requested for two, the thinking is also that the approach which is being used, especially by organizations like Momentum, will make it very, very easier for implementation because they've been in business for a very, very long time. But the main challenge, which we did not even discuss, but as the one in charge of my group, I can boldly bring it out. Yes. How do we ensure that the various organizations who give out grants will all sign into this project and demand the same reporting standard? So we will not have the grant organizations still maintaining their reporting standards, which will be totally different from what everybody is signing on to. And that's one of the big issues which needs to be looked at. For most of the organizations I work with as grant organizations are so subjective and stuck to their own principles, especially where they are linked to various governments, that it will take a lot of work for them to submit to these new international standards, which we are considering. Thank you, Charles. Fantastic uh, comments and observations. I really appreciate that. Um, let me again respond to a couple of just a couple of them. Um, you you talked about uh, that the bottom line, the profitability. Uh, of non-profit organizations, which is, of course, this challenge that we have. They're not for profit. So what do we call it and how do we measure sustainability? And as you said, um, there's a lot of variation about how organizations recognize income. So some will recognize it as it's receivable and then they offset what's spent and then what's carried forward might be for different funds. That's what the process they use in the UK. In other countries, they might, uh, anything that's not spent, they put it on the balance sheet as deferred income. So you end up with income recognized equal to expenditure spent. So you don't really get much on the bottom line because you only recognize the income to the extent that you've spent it. So that is also used in some countries. And it's also really common to have uh, reporting as well. So you get this huge variety and something as simple as what's your income, which is often a, an indicator, becomes a very difficult question to answer because there's so much variation. Um, so as a project, we're not at the moment saying this is the proposed way of measuring income. We're putting it out for consultation, uh, which is something that we'll talk about in a minute. So different stakeholders can say, well, we, we think this way of measuring income would be helpful. And also this way of um, presenting the financial statements would be helpful. Do we want a bottom line? 
Do we want something that says surplus at the bottom of our income scale? Or is that misleading? Um, so there's lots of different sort of angles on it and we'll be getting input from all over the world. And as you say, this humentum approach of trying to get global input and buy-in even during the development process uh, is really necessary so that by the time it's produced, it's not coming from a standing start where people are, well, what's that about? Hopefully they've had a chance to input. I'm hoping you, Charles, also will input your, your comments as we go along. Um, and then the other thing you mentioned about, yes, sustainability. Um, this is something that Humentum, we have training courses on how to measure sustainability in not-for-profits. Um, and it's not easy, is it? But two of the ways that we recommend are looking at the reserves and the number of days worth of reserves. And that's not always easy to tell how much an organization's reserves are, especially if you defer, well, if you defer your restricted grant income, it's really what's left. But sometimes organizations do or don't do that. We can't see what the reserves are. And another way is obviously looking at donor dependency, how much, what percentage of your income is coming in from restricted funds, how much unrestricted income do you get? Um, those sorts of things. So there's, yeah, and you're quite right. Actually determining sustainability at the moment is quite hard because of the variety of uh, financial statements. So thank you so much for those. I, this, I can also see some really good questions coming in the chat. I hope you can also see those. So um, KDS from the Institute of Chartered Accountants, Ghana, um, has said, what, no, no, sorry, first Edward Siame, I hope I'm pronouncing that right. What's the role of IFAC in this new standard, the Inter International Federation of Accountants? So they are the sort of over, they're the body that is even above ISB and um, IPSASB, if you like, and all the different professional accountancy organizations, including ICAG, report to IFAC as members. So IFAC is certainly aware about this. Um, ISB and IPSASB are very aware. When we issue the consultation paper, IFAC will be sending out a communication to all their members, encouraging them to participate in the same way that they do for IFRS and SASB uh, consultations. So IFAC um, are not leading on it, but they're certainly aware and they, they're wanting to engage with us on that. The standing committee, so what we have at the moment is uh, Humentum and SIPFA are the implementing partners. We have a steering group um, that's kind of not Humentum or SIPFA, but is kind of overseeing the project. Um, that steering group is currently just made up of three wonderful and very influential individuals. But our hope is that in the longer term, we would be able to transition so that this guidance is owned by a recognized body so that it can be maintained in the long term. So a few years ago, IASB and IPSASB put to their members they presented the case that uh, guidance for NPOs was necessary and they presented the, asked the, their members should they develop the standard themselves and they concluded that they shouldn't. They didn't have the resources or the mandate. However, they are very interested that we're doing it. They're very closely involved and our hope is that ultimately one of those entities would take on the role of uh, owning it and maintaining it in the longer term. Um, so in terms of the cu current committee, you can see that on the website, you can look on the governance uh, tag on the website, this, uh, the Auditor General of Jamaica is the um, chair, we have John Bernstein in the US, who's the former CFO of Ford Foundation, and we have Asia Tudouf, who is from Senegal, uh, and who works at Gavi. So those are the three members of the current steering group. Hope that answers your question, Edward. Very good question. This governance and sustainability of the guidance is so, so critical. Then uh, KDS from, um, I'll, I'll, I'll bring you in a minute, Annie. Let me just answer this question. I'll bring you in, Annie. Thank you. KDS from ICAG has asked, challenge specific NGOs have specific donors who will usually demand somehow similar reporting requirements except for the names of the account headings. <laughs> right, so how we actually classify expenditure is really important. It's one of the questions we'll be putting for consultation. One is on the face of the income statement. Do we want you know, fundraising expenses, program expenses, admin? Do we want these functional groupings? Do we want um, 
by type, salaries, transport? What, what, what is the best way to actually uh, summarize expenditure categories on the income statement? Now, each donor, when you're reporting to a donor, you're usually reporting against a specific budget. And sometimes that budget will just be the way that you've drawn it up and they've agreed to it. Sometimes it will be according to the expenditure lines that the donors themselves have, like USAID have their you know, eight sections, don't they? Um, so for this project, um, as, I, as I sort of tried to, to mention before, with this project isn't about harmonizing the donor re reporting requirements. There's another project that is working on that. So, and USAID is part of that working group. So uh, the headings that come up, on, come up on could be the same as each other and there could be consistency there. And then we can look at the expenditure analysis for the, for the face of the financial statements and get clarity there. Uh, they might be the same as each other. Let's see, we're talking to each other. So as the process evolves, we can make sure we don't do things that conflict uh, with each other. So um, that's a really important question. And it's something that's why we have this donor reference group uh, so that we can have really important conversations with those uh, influential donors uh, to bring them on board. Um, Annie, would you like to come in? You had your hand raised. Yes, please. Thank you. Mine is not a question. I'm Annie from PKF. Mine is not a question, but a contribution on the challenges, one of the challenges that I foresaw is the box ticking or all size fits all. Um, some of the donors may be small by nature and others may be very big. So if we have a standard and we are going by that standard for uniformity sake and for clarity sake, at the end of the day, differing donor interests may vary because if they compare their smaller size with the bigger sizes, they may not be able to um, analyze cost benefits analysis feasibly. And that is a challenge I have spotted. Thank you. Annie, thank you so much. And that's absolutely right. There's huge diversity in the sector, isn't there, between you know, a tiny community-based organization that operates under a mango tree in a village, all the way through to some massive FHI, international global uh, organization uh, with a huge variety of different activities, um, climate things, and you know, you, there's so many different, much diversity. So as a project, what we have, what we're proposing to do is focus on the needs of small and medium NPOs. Uh, just like sort of IFRS for SME is designed to cover the majority of financial reporting issues for small and medium uh, businesses, the IFR for NPO initial focus is designed to be for smaller and medium sized NPOs, not the micro. It won't cover all the different requirements for the huge but to try and meet the majority of issues relevant to small and medium. That's the idea. Uh, so I hope that answers uh, or gives some response to your, to your very important comment. Thank you, Annie. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'm just responding to some more questions in the chat. Um, will we make a recording? Yes, so we're recording now and the recording of this meeting will go up on the website after the event, so you can actually uh, refer people to it. Um, KDS, I'm sorry, I don't know your name, KDS. But KDS from uh, ICAG is mentioning another challenge. Different donors require different reports and reporting guidelines. Um, and the solution, specific NGOs have specific donors who usually demand similar reporting requirements, except for the name assigned to the account headings. Can we adopt the single audit concept to address this? This has actually been mentioned. One of the members on the practitioner advisory group is um, from USAID. And one of the things that she's brought up and we've been talking about is being able to have a schedule or a note to the accounts, which uh, would address the needs of the major donors of the organization so that they could more realistically rely 
on the audit of the year-end financial statements rather than every single donor requiring their own separate audit of their project funds. So we really hope to design the financial reports in such a way that donors can place more reliance on them and we reduce this need and the burden of duplicative audit processes. So that's certainly the aim and that's one of the, the issues being, being looked at. It's really important. Um, Al Fafa says salaries in the Human Aid Commission, Hack Sudan, is classified as an admin cost, which should not exceed 25% of total cost. This is one of the main challenges we face. How will IFR help on this? So we're having similar problems in India, for example. India has just introduced a new law that's very unpopular, um, requiring MPOs to classify certain types of expenses as indirect versus direct, irrespective of whether they genuinely are direct or indirect in terms of the way the organization is structured and the activities, it's mandated by law. So obviously as a project and as an accounting standard, you, we don't have the mandate to, um, it wouldn't be appropriate to interfere in country level, jurisdiction level decisions. However, there is certainly a conversation about having some standardization about how direct and indirect costs are classified and how they might be presented in the financial statements. Now, if there is an international standard, a recognized and adopted international standard that gives some guidance on direct and indirect costs, which at the moment there is no international standard for that, then hopefully citizens in a country would have a good basis for lobbying uh, or advocating on behalf of their organizations with their own governments in their own jurisdictions. So I wouldn't say that as a project we can help in an active way, but what an international standard does is it gives um, weight to uh, national level um, organizations in approaching their governments for uh, better or more meaningful regulation, uh, uh, things like that. So that's a really, it, you know, Sudan isn't alone. It's, it's quite common with different governments now trying to impose rules about admin rates uh, and indirect cost rates, which I, we as a project feel is, is counterproductive. We need those admin costs to build infrastructure to support the projects that get delivered. Um, so probably counterproductive. Uh, I'll just do a few more questions and then we'll move on to the second half of the presentation. Um, Bihenyo, Bihenyo, I'm not sure your name. When it comes to filling out of our financial returns, the Registrar General of Ghana, the international organizations have different financial reporting periods. So the US is October, September, Ghana is always January to December. The international organizations always get their audited report later and have issues with penalties. Can this outfit make this known to the Registrar General of Ghana to waive the penalties? So again, as, as a a project, um, we won't get involved directly with lobbying to uh, you know, national level regulators. However, uh, Edmund mentioned that one of the brilliant byproducts or side products of this project is an online forum or community, a community of stakeholders. And on the online forum, we can have a group specifically for um, specifically for stakeholders in Ghana. And you can then all find a way to organize. And there might also be other uh, forums or networks within Ghana where you can organize and come together to lobby uh, the regulators on specific issues that are relevant to you. Um, but certainly I, I would be remiss if I promised that we could lobby the Ghana government to waive penalties. I think that's probably outside the scope of what we can do as a project. Um, uh, ah, so, okay, KDS, this is David of PKF in Ghana, thank you. Um, uh, another one with reporting periods. So, I'm not sure that we, we haven't actually talked about reporting periods. It's interesting that you bring, I'm going to make a note of this because it hasn't come up in, uh, in any of the discussions so far, actually, at the practitioner advisory group or the technical advisory group with different jurisdictions mandating different reporting periods. 
So um, I'll bring that up. It's a really good question. Super. I think that's all of those. I would like to move on to the next stage of the um, presentation. Is that okay, Edmund? Are there other, would you like us to open it up for longer or should we move on to the next? Now? Well, um, a question just popped up from Matthias. What do you want to look at that? Oh, full cost recoveries from donors. Um, so yeah, as I mentioned, the, uh, there is currently no standard for how um, indirect costs are measured or anything. There's a, a project that Humentum is, in, is leading called the True Cost Project. Um, and it's really about that. It's about understanding the true cost of delivering projects, both the direct and the indirect element, and lobbying or, or working with donors to encourage them to increase their contributions towards uh, overhead costs, basically saying, by giving 5% of direct costs, that's not adequate to actually fund the real costs of delivering the projects that you're funding. So that is uh, separate but linked. So that's a separate advocacy um, project that Humentum is doing. What we do want, what we, that project is using audited accounts to try and calculate the real genuine overhead or admin rate or whatever you want to call it for nonprofits. And that's quite difficult. So that they're having to reanalyze the accounts to, to put them on a consistent pr presentation to get meaningful data. So hopefully this project will provide a consistent way in which users can see, ah, this is the actual indirect rate of this organization. And so if you've got audited accounts that show you have an actual audited indirect rate, and your donor says, so say your audited rate is, I don't know, 20%, and your donor says, we'll only give 7%, you've got something pretty solid you can go back to your donors with for negotiation. So that's something we'd like to do to strengthen the arm of NPOs by have, giving more transparency to that overhead rate. Um, it's a real challenge, absolutely big problem. Thank you for mentioning that. I've noted that as well. Um, it's just great to have all these comments uh, coming back from different countries because so, I can then reflect that back to the advisory groups and things, which is really valuable. So thank you. So I think what we'd like to do now is move on to the second uh, part of this presentation, um, which is going to take a closer look at this consultation phase. Edmund mentioned that there are three phases of the project, consultation phase, exposure draft and final guidance. So the consultation process is going to be launched in January next year. Um, so we're going to look at who should participate and why. Uh, what does that consultation process actually look like? What's in the consultation paper? And how practically should uh, interested people respond? So first of all, first of all, who, oh, let's, uh, oh, there. So first of all, who should participate? Well, everybody here is invited to participate. Uh, and as a project, we're particularly interested to hear the views of regulators. Um, those, that's the, you know, those are the authority to decide whether NPOs are allowed to or required to adopt uh, certain accounting practices within their country. So that would be really essential. Um, so if you could get the, the regulators in Ghana to, to contribute their views, that'd be very helpful. Uh, auditors of NPO level financial statements. I know we have PKF here and probably others as well. Please do uh, share your views. So funders, so uh, you might have Ghana based foundations, but maybe also offices of global institutions that have their offices in Ghana. So there might be a Ghana office of USAID, for example, I'm not sure. Um, but so Ghana based uh, funders of all types, especially those that are in finance or contracts who award grants and, and set reporting guidance for grantees and do that due diligence work that was mentioned earlier. Uh, and crucially, of course, NPOs as preparers, that would be you know, senior finance staff. Uh, you don't want all these decisions made on your behalf. We need to hear your voices as well so that it goes into the, the soup of different uh, viewpoints and perspectives. And then as a project, we'll be balancing out those different perspectives. So that's the who. Uh, if we look at the why, if you think, you know, without input from stakeholders in Ghana, 
there'll be aspects of you know the cultural context in Ghana that may not be reflected. Um, the needs and realities of various stakeholders in Ghana won't be seen in the proposals that are put forward. Uh, so this is really an opportunity to shape the future. You could think of future, future generations of Ghanaians looking back and thanking you for being involved so that it's fit for purpose uh, and really does meet the needs that you have. Sometimes these projects can be sort of done in an office in New York and then you're just informed, this is the new standard. We really didn't want to take that approach. I've lived, as I said, in Uganda for 20 years and I've experienced what it's like feeling like these great big decisions that impact you significantly are made without your consultation and it's frustrating. So in this project, we've designed it really proactively and deliberately to make sure that MPOs as well get a, get a say. So they're not just consumers or uh, an affected, they have a chance to affect the, uh, the outcome. If I've said that the right way around. Then the last uh, real reason why we'd love you to participate in this consultation process is to build the credibility of the project itself. Um, imagine if we get a thousand responses from 150 countries. What that does is it gives us a really strong evidence base for the exposure draft. It, ma it makes a great case when we're presenting to regulators for why they should adopt it. Um, and it also helps us with fundraising. As Edmund mentioned, the project isn't fully funded. We've got funding for the first phase. If we get a dribble of responses, it was gonna be really hard for us to justify that this is important, needed, that people care. If we get lots of responses, it, it gives us a fantastic base to raise funds to finish. So there's lots of different reasons uh, why it would be important for you to con con participate in the consultation process. So looking at the sort of what, well, the consultation process is shaped by a big document called the consultation paper. It's, it's in its final stages of development right now, but it might, will end up being probably around 200, 250 pages. So it's important to understand uh, so how it's structured. So after the executive summary, uh, there's a preface, which I think we've just renamed as an introduction. Um, and that introduction really sets out the objectives for the project, explains who should respond and how, and that's you no know, short, essential reading. Then the bulk of the paper and all the questions that we're looking for your feedback on are in two main sections called part one and part two. And we'll look at these in more depth shortly. In general terms, part one looks at landscape level, overview level issues, and part two takes a closer look at a number of specific accounting and reporting issues. Then there's a lot of supplementary information provided that gives more context about the project. It has annexes that show, you know, what's the current treatment required in IFRS, in Ipsas, in New Zealand, in the UK, et cetera. It, you know, analyzes all the current practice. And then there's a glossary um, give, explaining the meaning of terms as intended when we've used the terms, what do we mean? Because some terms mean different things in different countries. This isn't changing the meaning in any given jurisdiction. It's really just to explain what we mean when we use a certain term. So in the next two slides, we're just gonna go a bit deeper and see uh, what, what it looks like, these different sections. So I'm gonna give you an overview of the types of questions and the types of feedback that will be asked of you from this consultation paper. So part one uh, is about these framework level issues, like how to describe nonprofit organizations, who are stakeholders, who are the users of financial reports. It's written in plain English and it's pitched to be as accessible to a broad audience of stakeholders, uh, to a really broad audience, I should say, of stakeholders interested in financial reporting, not just accountants. So it should be uh, possible for anyone with an interest in financial reporting to read it and make sense of it. So each chapter uh, presents a proposal and then ends with a request for general matters for comment. In other words, you are invited to comment on the general level matters presented in the paper. And then, uh, and then these questions take the form, do you agree with the proposal? If not, why not? 
So in that sense, the question is open, but it's structured. You have to read the chapter in order to be able to submit a comment on it. Now, part two is about specific accounting issues, like when to recognize grant income or whether to disclose gifts in kind or how to measure inventory that doesn't have a sale value, that sort of thing. So it's also written in plain English and it's pitched to be accessible to a more technical audience, familiar with accounting concepts and language. Now each section in part two first describes the issue and then presents some alternative treatments. And then each section ends with a request for specific matters for comment, SMCs. In other words, you're invited to comment on the specific matters presented in the section. So generally the questions take the form, do you agree with the description, the way we've described this issue? Do you agree with the alternatives that have been presented? If not, why not? Uh, and then which alternative would you prefer and why? So it's necessary to have read the section and the alternatives before you can meaningfully submit a response. And this provides the project with really structured responses that can be analyzed. They can also be analyzed by stakeholder group and by region. So you can kind of understand if there are really different views, which types of stakeholders are they coming from and how might we move forward in reconciling those differences. So we've had, um, we've seen the sort of overall shape of part one and part two. So now we're just gonna take a, a deeper look uh, at part one. So the next two slides, I wanna give you a taste for the types of questions to expect specifically in part one of the consultation paper. I should say, a uh, caveat that these questions are examples of ones that have been considered to date by the technical and practitioner advisory groups, but they are currently being reviewed to help maximize the usefulness of the information we get back. So they might be slightly different when they're issued in, in January, but I hope this will give you a flavor. So part one, chapter one of the consultation paper is all about which organizations would be considered nonprofit organizations for the purpose of the guidance. And then it proposes some broad characteristics. For example, uh, any surpluses generated are not distributed to members or investors. They are retained for the charitable purposes or the missional social purposes of the organization. That's one example. So there's some broad characteristics that are stated um, and of course, within a, a, a given country, there might be different legal formats, there might be different names for different types of organizations. So for something to be internationally applicable, we've come up with these broad characteristics. So then the question is, do you agree with these broad characteristics that have been proposed? If not, how can we make them better? Now, chapter two, part one, chapter two of the consultation paper is all about the external stakeholders or the users of nonprofit financial reports and what their information needs are. So it presents a proposal with some expl explanation and asks, do you agree that their information needs are A, B, C, D? I think here it's uh, achievement of objectives, economy and efficiency, compliance with restrictions and regulations, and longer term financial health. Are those the right things? Are those the things that users want to know? Uh, again, if not, why not? What alternative areas would you propose and why? So part one, chapter three is all about aspects of the guidance itself. It presents some proposals. And one of the questions is about um, the basis. So the proposal is it sets out why we think that accrual based guidance would be most effective for small and medium sized and nonprofit organizations. But then it says, what challenges, if any, do you foresee if the guidance is accrual based? Indicate what other approach or approaches might, might meet the guidance objectives and explain why. So again, structured, but open. So part one, chapter four is all about existing financial reporting frameworks. So firstly, it makes the case that the IFR for MPO guidance must draw on existing frameworks. It can't start with a completely blank sheet of paper. And then it sets out criteria for evaluating the usefulness of existing frameworks for this project. And then it assesses 
I think it's IFRS, IFRS for SME and IPSAS, B, IPSAS. It assesses those international frameworks against the criteria. I think there are three questions in this chapter, but one of them is, do you agree with the criteria that we've used? Are these the right criteria? Um, and if not, why not? What other criteria could be used and why do you agree with the assessments, etc.? cetera? Then chapter five, which is kind of where all of this is leading, puts forward a proposed model for developing the guidance. And in this model, we, we're proposing to use IFRS for SME as a foundational framework, uh, but also drawing on IFRS, IPSAS, and jurisdiction level standards as needed to develop the guidance. So the question is, do you agree with the model uh, as proposed? Do you have any concerns about using IFRS for SME? Uh, that sort of thing. So that gives you a snapshot. Part one is five chapters. Each chapter has two to four questions. Um, and I hope that gives you an idea of the kinds of topics, the kinds of questions. And if you have strong opinions about any of those, great, that's exactly what we want. We want you to share your opinions on those so that that goes into the decision-making processes. So just as mentioned, in each case, you need to carefully read the relevant chapter and then give uh, structured input uh, so that we can really analyze that feedback and um, by stakeholder type, by region and feed that into the drafting process. Okay, I'm just looking at my timing. We'll keep moving. So set, we're nearly there. Set part two of the consultation paper is now taking a deeper dive into some more specific accounting issues. So the, the, the approach that's been taken is that the normal transactions that NPOs do that might be similar to a, non, to a, a normal business, uh, we won't, we'll just use IFRS for SME for that. If it's already covered in IFRS for SME, fine. But in part two, we're consulting on specific unique issues that are specific to the nonprofit sector, unique to the nonprofit sector. Because that's what we're going to need to build and weave into and on top of and around IFRS for SME to get a one stop shop kind of booklet that can be the go to uh, standard or guidance for nonprofit organizations. So again, this is still in draft, it's still under construction, uh, but want to share with you so you have a sense of it. So the types of specific issues that have been discussed are shown here, like how should NPO financial statements be presented, exactly as I think is Charles, uh, I hope I've already mind, mentioned earlier. Uh, what should be included within the narrative reports that accompany NPO financial statements? As Edmund said at the beginning, the numbers by themselves really don't have much meaning, divorced from the activities, the impact, the social uh, work, uh, environmental work that organizations do. So what should be, what would be a bare minimum, if you like, or guidance for what should be included in a narrative report to accompany those financial statements? How should expenses be classified? How should income be recognized? Specifically income from grants, donations, gifts in kind, those sorts of income that really we don't generally see in uh, for-profit businesses. And you can see some other aspects there. So the answers to these questions really aren't obvious. There is no one right answer. And MPOs in countries without guidance have to make up their own answers on a case by case basis. Maybe it's NPO by NPO, maybe it's auditor by auditor, donor by donor. And that's why we have so much diversity, inconsistency, conflict. Uh, it's not that MPOs aren't good at doing their financial reporting, it's that there is no one obvious answer necessarily for what the right and best way is for these uh, to treat these different aspects. So we can see uh, that these issues in part two are more technical in nature. I won't do a deep dive into each one, but basically within part two of the paper, for each of these different uh, issues here, um, it sets out some basic information about the issue, describes the issue, and then it um, offers some alternatives for different treatments that you might like or not. And then you're invited to state which one you would prefer and why. 
So we do plan to hold webinars specifically on each of these issues. So the, the outreach that we're doing by, at the moment is by country. So we've got Ghana today, we had Afghanistan last week, Kenya, we've got Jamaica and UK coming up. We're doing country level outreach. Closer to the um, release of the consultation paper, we'll be doing topic level webinars. So anybody from around the world can come and see a webinar about specifically about income recognition. And we'll do a deep dive on that one topic. So that when you do come to share your thoughts, you come from a really, you know, you feel that you've engaged with the material well enough to share your opinions. So that's it, part one, landscape level issues, part two, a bit more detail. Um, and hopefully by now you're feeling that you would like to share your opinions and your perspectives and the only question left is how to do it. So we're working uh, to make sure it's as easy as possible for relevant stakeholders to share your views. So if you'd only like to share your opinions to part one on these general matters, uh, but, uh, but you're not so interested or you don't have much to say on the detailed level, that's fine. Uh, if you just want to answer one the you know, questions for one chapter, that's fine. If you want to respond on grants income, but you have nothing to say on inventory, that's fine. So you can just comment on the bits that are relevant to you. Um, we're hoping that certainly regulators and auditors and institutes might be able to give a full response and cover the majority of it. But for MPOs, maybe the specific bits that will be more or less relevant to you and for donors as well, funders. So when we, um, when we launch the consultation phase early next year, we'll be making some videos to make it clear exactly how to submit your responses and how to um, make it easier to engage with all the written information. You don't just have to download the 200 word document, 200 page document. And uh, you know, we, we're trying to make it easy to, to engage with it. Um, so in the middle of next year, we also plan to hold some country level round table meetings. Uh, where stakeholders can discuss their opinions in relation to particular chapters in part one and sections in part two. We might uh, get some countries together. So we don't, we probably don't have the resources to hold a separate meeting in every country, but we might get three or four countries within a region who share a language to, to come together uh, to share opinions uh, as well. So, as I said, the official launch will be, and the, the website really will be the main place to go. So uh, look out for, for information on the website. Um, and if you're signed up to the newsletter, then you will automatically get an email invitation to participate. So that's the, the best way to make sure you can be involved. So let me wrap up here, but the single most important message that I would like you to take away from this whole meeting is please respond to the consultation process because your opinion and your perspective really matters to the project. So with that, I will hand back to Edmund to manage a question process. Well, thank you, um, Samantha, for a very detailed presentation of um, part two of this virtual country awareness uh, meeting. If there are questions, we'll love to take them now. You can use the chat feature or function. Otherwise, you may also want to raise a hand and then unmute yourself and ask your question. We're trying to work within the allotted time, two hours, we have about 13 minutes to go. It might be a comment as well as, it might not be a question, it might be an observation or another comment or something that came up in your earlier uh, small group chats that you weren't able to share. So just feel free. You could also share if you are interested in participating. Are you feeling this is something you would like to do or feel competent to do? Um, what we're finding in some countries, there's a bit consultation overload. So in the UK, people are being asked for their opinion all the time. It's like countries that have yeah. vote and they've taken it for granted they find that citizens don't vote so hopefully you're feeling you would like to do this it'd be great to get an indication maybe in the chat do you think you will uh participate in the consultation process or does it sound too difficult somebody else will do it all right 
Thank you, Samantha. Um, we do have uh, Professor Williams Atulik, who is the president of the Institute of Chartered Accountants. Yeah, um, hello. Hello. Please go ahead. Matthias, your hand is raised. Yeah, okay. Yes. Um, I, thank you, Samata, for this brilliant presentation. Uh, when you went, when we were at the, the presentation, you mentioned some of the accounting issues that come out. And that's very good, though not exhaustive. But I want us to draw our attention to a critical funding stream of uh, most NGOs. Let's say well wish International JSI that deal with uh, uh, medical supplies. They, present, they have gifts in kind, constituting a very large portion of their portfolio. Many of the NGOs have different ways of of re re realizing that evidence for us to capture it clearly it, during the, uh, the, the the consultation paper process. So uh, uh, that is just my thought that we could look at the gift in kind aspect of these NGOs and how it's being realized just like the incomes, uh, how incomes are being realized. It will be very great. Thank you yeah, so much. Recognition that that that's yeah. absolutely. So yeah. in this chapter on the section in part two on income recognition, it absolutely includes donations in kind of gifts and of services. Uh, that's very, and it's a matter of a lot of discussion and great contention uh, in the advisory groups. So you're absolutely right. That's something that will be covered here. The other thing I should mention, Matthias, you meant, you said that this isn't, this, this isn't exhaustive. So the very beginning of part two it gives the, the rationale for how we came up with this list, which things we, dis we discussed, but didn't make it to the short list, but made it to the long list. And it asks for consultation on, are these the right issues? Are there other burning issues that are in the long list, but we should be including at the exposure draft stage? Um, so your comment that it doesn't include everything really important and there will be a chance for you to and for others to share their views on what's missing as well as what's in here. Great, thank you. So uh, we have 10 minutes to go. I'd like to invite um, Professor William Satulik, the president of the Institute of Chartered Accountant, who would uh, give us a word as uh, regulators of the accountancy profession in Ghana on the development of international financial reporting guidance for NPUs. Professor Atulik, over to you. All right, uh, Edmond, thank you very much. And uh, thank you everyone for an excellent uh, job done. Um, it's interesting uh, and exciting to, to follow uh, as regulators of the profession, uh, we think that the right way want to see uh, an improved uh, practice in the accountancy uh, profession in Ghana in all of its dimensions, uh, the public sector, in the, in the, in the uh, NGO sector, uh, in the private sector, in fact, in all the different Industrial settings we want to see to uh, practice. So it is refreshing to uh, follow this discussion uh, that we uh, are in the process of uh, developing guidance on reporting in the main energy sector. Uh, we shall follow this development and keep this uh, and we learn our support to it uh, as much as uh, is possible. And so, um, I think uh, we have to reach out. Uh, uh, I, I will expect uh, us to you know, collaborate more and, and see how we can, we can uh, expand the, uh, 
the inclusion of as many practitioners as possible in the Ghana so that uh, we can all brainstorm and think and enrich the process so that practice within the NGOs in Ghana can see the further enhancement. So, thank you all for uh, the coming. Well, uh, thank you, Prof. William Satulik. We lost a bit of what you said, but the gist of it is that there is um, absolute support and collaboration from the Institute of Chartered Accountants, which is great. I will be following up with the Institute and with the Chief Executive to take this forward with a technical and research um, committee of the Institute. Well. Would like to thank all participants um, on this meeting, Kana Country Awareness Meeting. We've had 21 participants, um, one just dropped off. So 20 are sat now, and we're grateful that you made time to join. We'd like to acknowledge all the participants who participated, um, your time and your contributions. Um, have been really wonderful and we're really grateful to really have you. So on behalf of the project um, secretariat and then the project director for the IFR for NPU, Samantha, who is here on the call with us, I'd like to thank all of you. Um, we've had participation from Sudan and from Rwanda, which is wonderful. Uh, we're hoping that the next time we do call a meeting, the country round table, Mid next year, we will have even um, greater participation than this. Samantha, we're grateful for the support you've extended to Ghana, and we look forward to participating in subsequent um, meetings. Thank you very, very much. And thank you to Edmund for volunteering to be the country champion for Ghana and for doing such a great job in uh, getting the word out there and uh, involving uh, the Institute of Chartered Accountants of Ghana. We're very honored to have, have you involved as well. Uh, a couple of final things just before we close. So um, one way that you can stay involved and engaged with the project is to join the online forum. Um, it's actually, as I speak, it's under maintenance, I'm afraid to say, but within the next week or so, when you go to the website, which is www.ifr4npo.org, you'll see something called a forum in the top right. And here there's a general forum. Uh, there's a forum for specific accounting issues, and there'll also be groups, uh, probably by country. Um, we might have, uh, as, it, as it progresses, we might have groups for different stakeholder types as well. So this will be a great place to meet other people with an interest in financial reporting globally, um, engage with the issues, share some thoughts, ask questions, etc. So um, if you sign up to the, the next most important thing is to sign up to the newsletter. Uh, and if you do that, when the forum is live, we'll send you an invitation to remind you to, to join that. So the newsletter is bi-monthly. It's not it's like every two months. It's not going to fill your inbox. Uh, this is a long, slow burn project, but it just means you can keep abreast of developments, make sure you're invited to participate in the consultation process, in the webinars, etc. cetera. Um, the other thing you can do is follow, uh, follow us on LinkedIn and Twitter if you're active there, and please share, share those posts. So, if there's 20 of you here, if you each share in your own networks, hopefully, as Edmund said, by the next time we are convening a meeting in Ghana, maybe we'll have 200 people, uh, which would be super. So please, if you can play your part in getting the word out there, that would be absolutely super. And then if you're excited about this project and its aims, uh, we'd be great to have you endorse it. Uh, with your logo or just your organization name on the website and again what that does is it builds the credibility it just demonstrates that there really is interest uh, in this project going forward so um, if you have any questions um, please do reach out to Edmund we will be sending an email uh, with a summary of some of the issues that you raised and links to the video and the slide deck uh, and the various links uh, within the presentation as well 
So uh, I will hand back to uh, Edmund to say the very final word, but thank you so, so much for having me. Thank you for inviting me and thank you for coming. Um, it's been a pleasure to be with you today. Right, thank you, Samantha, most grateful. Um, would you kindly stop sharing the screen so we can take a group photo? Um, That's a good idea. And gallery view, yeah, wonderful. If you're happy to turn on your camera, that is fine. Otherwise, um, we can take it with the various food. So I just give a few minutes. If you're happy to turn on your camera, wonderful. We really want to get out of here by 12 o'clock. Um, so. <laughs> All right, great. Thank you very much. Grateful to have all of you and um, have a wonderful day. Enjoy the rest of the day. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.